Hi, Richard. I'm hoping that you can tell me something about these wonderful door stops that I inherited with the house that I'm in. Um, two of them are cast iron. The other one looks homemade. Um, it has, uh, it's wood and it has like a needlepoint front on it. And it has some kind of uh, weight in it. Uh, you can hear it when you pick it up. It uh, makes noise because there's something inside that's weighing, weighing it down. Anyway, I thought maybe you could tell us something about these door stops, which I think were very popular uh, during the Victorian era. I'm guessing these date to around the 1920s, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Well, this is another edition of Ask a Curator. And <clears throat> we certainly have been getting some very interesting uh, photographs and comments and conversation. And people are now beginning to send us their own things that they'd like information about. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Something pretty ordinary sounding, and that's a doorstop. So just for fun, I thought I'd Google doorstop, the history of the doorstop on Google. And I was really surprised to think that they somehow thought that doorstops were not created until the Civil War period, as though we hadn't had doors before that time. And then I also was interested to note that they had come up with someone in the 1920s who'd invented the doorstop. And since they appear in catalogs in the 1880s, that didn't make very much sense. So it just proves again that it's best to ask a curator than to ask Google. So the doorstop we have to look at um, is probably one of the most popular doorstops made by a company from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the Hubley Company. Hubley goes back to really, I think, the 1890s. And they specialized in cast iron toys. A lot of the cast iron toys you see in museums are definitely Hubley toys. I think their first catalog was 1894 and fire trucks and trains were very popular. And by about 1900, they started making doorstops. Now, what makes a Hubley toy and a doorstop really special is their cast iron. So they last and last and last a long time. And Hubley's toy designers and their sculptors and painters just, I think, loved the whole concept of making all different kinds of cast iron doorstops. And why do you make a doorstop? Why do we have a doorstop? Well, <clears throat> many years ago, people were really into ventilation and they really wanted to keep doors opened as much as humanly possible. In the winter time, uh, maybe not quite as much, but certainly during the summertime to let air in. And if there's a slight breeze and you've opened your front door, or you've opened the front door and there are other doors in your house, your doors are all gonna close, so with a bang. So obviously something heavy, cast iron, is the logical thing for a doorstop. Now, if we wanted to go back to cave times, we really wouldn't have any doorstops, we didn't have any doors. But if we went to the Renaissance, probably most doors in ordinary people's houses, or certainly most doorstops, would have been stones or a brick, something of that nature, which in fact can scratch your floor and is heavy and oftentimes dirty. So you can see why the French and English in the 1700s started making bronze and brass doorstops. Now, the original doorstops weren't quite as funky as our dog, uh, which we are looking at today. They are more elegant, they're scrolls, and they're also weighty. They're usually cast iron, and then they're covered with a, a thin casting of, of usually brass, but they have handles on them. So they're three feet high which is really so smart for a doorstop because you don't have to bend over and move it. You can just sort of carry it around. It has an attached hook on the top of it. Well, that logic seemed to have disappeared by the Victorian period. And certainly by the 1880s, the standard doorstop was something figural. In England, there's Punch, Punch and Judy ones, and animals, sheep seem to be one of the most popular things for a doorstop. Here in the United States, particularly with the Hubley Company, they went all out. I happened to look at 
eBay today also to see how many doorstops, um, Hubley doorstops made by the Hubley company were on eBay. And it was interesting to see that there were over 450 Hubley doorstops on eBay, of which there were at least 100 different designs. And the designs are almost everybody's dog, almost everybody's cat. Just recently, the Historical Society was given this guy, um, which is really great. We're going to use it as a doorstop here at the Moran studio. And it's of a pussycat. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that it doesn't say Hubley, which means that it's not made by Hubley, really. Hubley always is marked very clearly. Hubley Manufacturing Company or just Hubley. But because these things could be simply made in ironworks all over the country, a lot of Hubley doorstops, new castings, new molds were made, and they were then turned out by other companies and sold, not as Hubley, but so this cat, there's at least five different varieties of this cat, which are not Hubley at all, but still probably from the 1940s. So our Boston Terrier, that is what our, our person sent us a photograph of, there's an advertisement for that Boston Terrier in the 1938 Sears and Roebuck catalog, along with about 14 other uh, different Hubley, and they're advertised as Hubley because that was really the, the state of the art for uh, this particular form. And the making of them is interesting. At Hubley, they had sculptors who would make a wooden carving of whatever the door stop was going to be. Then they would make a casting from the sculpture, and they'd make a whole lot of molds, so they could make a whole lot of them at the same time. The iron was heated to 3,000 degrees. Um, this is supposed to cause purity. I'm not sure if it really does. When they come out of the mold, they're set to uh, dry or lose their heat, cool down. Then they're set off to a workshop where the corners are filed down so there's no sharp edges. And then they go to the painting studio where they're all painted a dark color, either a light or a dark color. They then go off to the colorist studio where there are about 50 people with enamel paints. And of course, they hand paint all of these. Every single one is hand painted. This one is painted black but it has hand-painted eyes, so they're green eyes. And the colorists were the ones who applied the color. The most rare ones are not dogs or cats, because of course those were the most popular. But one of the rarest ones is a Popeye, the sailor man. There's one of a bellhop. There's a Santa Claus one that is extremely desirable. And as I said, all different kinds of dogs and cats and whatever, sitting, doing whatever a cat might do. So we certainly thank the person for sending in this picture because it gave us time to do a little research on our not Hubley, the one that we, our visitor sent us was a Hubley one. So we could find out a little bit more about it and about the history of it. So if you have anything at home that you have a question about, please, Ask a curator, please contact uh, Mary Ann at East Hampton Historical Society.